Effigy of the failure. Having a horror of any action, he keeps telling himself, movement, what folly. It is not so much events which vex him as the notion of participating in them. And he bestirs himself only in order to turn away from them. His sneers have devastated life before he has exhausted its juice. He is a crossroads ecclesiast who finds in the universal meaninglessness an excuse for his defeats. Eager to find everything unimportant, he succeeds easily. The evidence preponderates on his side. In the battle of arguments, he is always the winner, as he is always the loser in action. He is right. He rejects everything, and everything rejects him. He has prematurely compromised what must not be compromised in order to live. And since his talent was over-enlightened as to his own functions, he has squandered it, lest it dribble away into the inanity of a work, bearing the image of what he might have been as a stigma and a halo. He blushes and flatters himself on the excellence of his sterility forever alien to naive seductions. The one free man among the elots of time, he extracts his liberty from the enormity of his lack of accomplishments. He is an infinite and pitiable God whom no creation limits, no creature worships, and whom no one spares. The scorn he has poured out on others is returned by them. He expiates only the actions he has not performed, though their number exceeds the calculations of his wounded pride. But at the end, as a kind of consolation, and at the close of a life without honors, he wears his uselessness like a crown. E. M. Cioran It was a year ago that I decided to format my thesis as audio. There was a need for speech, a need for presence, the need to make a moment visible, but not permanent, something that could be and belong, but that its meaning would include the future attempt for relevance, relevance in the sense of change. Sound gave me that possibility, words that could be heard words that don't wait for the listener, but that they are spoken out loud hoping to steal a moment from you. But what are those words talking about? What does that need for speech contained in the sentences being built and hopefully structured towards to? The work presented as my thesis is a statement of the practice I do. It contains the main subjects and concepts on which I base my practice. This statement attempts to explain a mechanism on which things, objects, actions, situations, occurrences, acquire meaning. The mechanism of the infraordinary. What is the infraordinary? When Perec talks about the infraordinary, he questions what happens to all we experience in everyday. What happens to the banal, the quotidian, the obvious, the common, the ordinary, the infraordinary, the background noise, the habitual? He suggests and proposes to question everything, to question bricks, concrete, glass, our table manners, our utensils, our tools, the way we spend our time, our rhythms, to question that which seems to have ceased forever to astonish us. We live true, we breathe true, we walk, we open doors, we go down staircases, we sit at the table in order to eat, we lie down in, on bed in order to sleep. How, why, where, when, why? And this question should be fragmentary, barely indicative of a method, at most of a project. It matters a lot to me, here is says that they should seem trivial and futile, 
That's exactly what makes them just as essential, if not more so. As all the other questions by which we have tried to vain to lay hold on our truth. This thesis is about visibility, about meaning, about futility, but also about meaninglessness, about availability to the knowledge within each particular experience. For me, the infraordinary arrived as a way to explain the practice I've been doing for four years in the Awande project. One project each day for four years. When I started, I didn't have a time frame or specific rules that would shape the project, but the everyday made sure to give them a format. The actions, objects, and situations within this project are always trying to question the everyday. What is the everyday? They try to question the importance of the meaninglessness and how this futility of doing is meaningful for me. The infraordinary gives a moment. The infraordinary gives meaning, but not permanence. It's not meant to last. It's not meant to give answers or create something new that will shape knowledge. It belongs within itself. One can belong with the everyday, to everyday, to the event that extraordinary situations provide. And one can belong to the infraordinary. But just as the concept of the infra means of Duchamp, the infraordinary is something that goes and only grasps as the opportunity for visibility and belonging arrives. But that is not meant for one to hold on to. That is why it was important to have these concepts at sound. A concept that it's trying to speak of itself within its own rules of existence. It exists only as it talks of itself in its own platform just as the soapbox practice. <clears throat> this soapbox practice in which a speaker stands on a, on a box and delivers a speech. What is the difference between the soapbox and any other kind of talk in the form of speech? One of the main elements on which I find the soapbox practice unique is in its nomad quality of belonging without settlement. There is a relationship between the speaker, the box, and the place where this box is settling. However, even if the place where this speech is being delivered has been chosen specifically, even if it might not have been the case, it is an ephemeral settlement. The box is located in a place of transit, but it's making a place of its own, one that will only last as long as the speaker is on top and the speech is taking place. And very much as the soapbox, speech delivered, the infraordinary eludes visibility once abandoned the top of the box. I can see the box, I see the speaker, but I cannot find the speech. It's waiting to be settling again, to belong in a time without a space. <laughs>